Welcome back, my fellow peanuts, and welcome to anyone new to the channel or to my podcast. Now, this podcast covers true crime cases that may not be suitable for young listeners. They may be graphic and violent content, so listener discretion is advised. Now, today's serial killer is someone I genuinely haven't heard anything about. So this is a new experience for a little bit of all of us. Uh, usually I've heard at least something, just like a little documentary, something here or there. However, this time, absolutely like no idea, no clue. So you, my listeners and viewers, we're in for a bit of a journey on this one. So our state is Missouri. Robert Bordella, or sorry, Burdella is our serial killer. Uh, things I've seen and read, uh, look, he's Missouri's John Wayne Gacy, right? So he had the nickname the Kansas City Butcher. Uh, our killer today is really, really sick and perverse at times, guys. He's a killer who kidnapped, raped, tortured uh, six men after holding them in his house. One victim was actually subjected to up to six weeks of torture. So I'm definitely going to warn everyone today that we're going to be talking about some really heavy topics. Um, this It's just another trigger warning, guys, because some of the videos or some of the pictures in the background, they might disturb some people. So please be mindful of this. Um, just want everyone to be aware that um, it's just not as easy uh, this time around. Obviously, we've dealt with some pretty disturbing topics before, but this one, you know, it's. I just want to be really, really clear, guys. There are some, some of the crime scene photos are just and some of the polaroids just so everybody's aware um i just want to also point out that my incredibly wonderful stepson uh gave me a jumper to wear today not sure if any of you can see it but it is homer simpson um but this is really really fabulous and in the background today i have a comic so this is the first cover that rogue has ever appeared on my other half actually got it for me and i think it's really really fabulous uh in case i haven't mentioned it before huge huge X-Men fan, uh, but in particular, Rogue is my favourite. So went off on a bit of a side note there, so sorry about that, guys. Um, but let's get back to our serial killer. It does never really cease to amaze me on how much I can read up on a person that I've really never met. Um, I couldn't find any documentaries this time, so but if I do, I'll update it in the description and also in my comment section. So we're going to start at the very beginning. This was all found through different articles, guys. So all of this was found through different means, uh, but predominantly on the internet and also just listening on YouTube and stuff like that. So Robert Andrew Berdella Jr. was born on January 31st, 1949 in Chihuahua, no, Chihuahua, Chihuahua Falls in Ohio, Iowa. Uh, I I even listened to the pronunciation. This is going to drive me. Chigoa. Chigoa Falls. Sorry. Um, had to get that right. Chigoa Falls. Uh, he would be the firstborn of two sons to Robert Andrew and Mary Louise Bordella. Oh, sorry, Verdella. His father would work at the Ford Motor Factory and he was really deeply religious. The family would attend uh, church on a regular basis and the boys would attend Sunday schools in the Catholic Church. So once again, we're going to hear about a childhood that we wouldn't wish upon our very worst enemy. It's not always easy reading these things, and I'm, but what I'm trying to understand about everything about this is why do they turn into serial killers? I'm certainly learning. Uh, in more than anything that perhaps some people just shouldn't be parents. Like, I'll be clear, some people, it just seems to me, should never have had children. He was a really intelligent kid, one that was happier or maybe not happier is not, probably not the right word, but he was quite the loner. He didn't really seem to enjoy going outside that often, but I wonder whether that was because he didn't really have any pl friends to play with and I wonder what if he was a loner because he was happier being by himself. I don't really know. I'm just reading a little bit between the lines. Um, he had a speech impediment. He wore Coke bottle, <laughs> Coke bottle thick glasses because he was severely nearsighted. And at the tender age of just five, he was actually diagnosed with high blood pressure. So he had to take a lot of meds during his childhood, which I imagine wouldn't have been really that easy. Like, let's be clear, that wouldn't be easy for anybody. I've seen this before and it really breaks my heart to read it every time I do. Robert's father, uh, he would end up valuing things like sports and athleticism as the height of a man manhood, um, especially if you were good at it. 
obviously Robert was not really athletic. However, his younger brother, Daniel, he showed a really natural ability of anything sports related from a really young age. And because of this, his father would compare them both on a regular basis and it really wasn't very favourable to Robert at all. And it's been fairly well noted and documented on the emotional and the physical abuse that his father would endure onto his family. Uh, He would use a leather strap in particular to beat them. Um, So it was just, it was, it was not an easy childhood, like by any stretch of the imagination. He did really well in school, but he was severely bullied due to his appearance and just in general, um, just for his, you know, just general nature. Um, just didn't get along with kids his own age. Um, He realised during puberty that he was gay, but he'd keep this to himself for quite some time. And he'd even have a girlfriend at some stage, just I'm guessing to be more like everybody else. Um, But he he did know he was gay. Now, around the same time that he would hit his mid-teens, he began to get a little bit of self-confidence. But at times this would actually present itself as arrogant and disrespectful but he would behave more specifically towards women in this way. But that, that's been really noted, that he was really quite arrogant and disrespectful to women. In 1965, uh, his father would die of a heart attack when he was just 39 years old. Um, and as you can imagine, Robert didn't take it very well. Uh, he became disillusioned with Catholicism and he began to question his faith. As a result of all this, he began reading up on all all types of faith and different religions, but he would become really cynical towards it all in just general. He was just very cynical towards any type of religion. On a side note, though, guys, it was about this age that he'd watch a movie called The Collector. A plot of this movie surrounds a man who stalks and kidnaps uh, a young woman that he seems to find attractive. He holds her captive in his windowless and stone basement type of thing. And he was viewing her as no more than just really an attractive woman. Uh, She ends up dying of contracted illnesses despite um, her kidnappers' efforts to keep her alive. He would state that this movie left a lasting impression on him. We are going to come back to that because it really had a lasting impact on him. So shortly after his father passed away, his mother would actually end up remarrying. Uh, This was met with a lot of resentment by her son. Um, He saw the uh, marriage as like a betrayal towards his dad and he became increasingly withdrawn. He would further immerse himself in his solitary activities. He just really, he didn't, he didn't want to participate in anything. But these particular activities would include painting, collecting coins, stamps, and just writing to his pen pals, uh, specifically pen pals in Vietnam and Burma. Now, these pen pals would end up actually writing him back. They'd send him things in his letters, such as stamps, photos of mythical and historical icons, just ancient cultures and architecture. And it was this habit in particular of writing to his pen pals and receiving things that would lead him to lead him, sorry, to have a real interest in primitive art, photography, and antiques. Around this time, so around 1965, uh, he began collecting all of these artifacts that he'd get sent. So it really started to, um, he really started to get a passion for all things arts related. It'll come back, like we're going to come back around to this, but um, he really, he really did like anything arts related. So it was, it's just very different. It sort of shows a very different side of him that he did love, love things like this. And he definitely loved history. Again, I'm just going to have a, quick cup of tea i've got today i need a hug with my care bear uh we've got fun shine and love a lot there on this one okay so robert would graduate from high school in 1967 he would receive really excellent grades he'd show some real potential in all of the art subjects something he just genuinely really loved doing um so he'd moved to kansas city and he'd uh that's in missouri by the way guys and he would attend the kansas city art institute uh he had dreams at this time of becoming a college professor and he seemed to do really well in his first year but after that it just seems 
like things really went downhill for him. He began abusing drugs and alcohol and he was even known around campus as a little bit of a small town, small town, small time drug dealer. This is where things sort of start getting pretty awful in his life, right? They've already, they're already not great. Uh, but he would begin to engage in animal torture in the name of art. Uh, this happened twice while he was at the Institute, one incident involving a duck and one involving a dog. Uh, I'm not going to be giving any details about that, guys. Uh, if you want to read about it, go ahead. I find it abhorrent um, when I read about animal, animal torture. And I know that makes me sound really awful because when I talk about victims and stuff like that, but I can't read anything. I can't verbalise <clears throat> what was done to the what was done to the animals. So when he was 19, he he actually ended up getting arrested for selling meth to an undercover police officer. He would post some bond and then he'd be released. He would later plead guilty to the offence and he'd receive a five-year suspended sentence. But just after, like just one month after this arrest, um, he, he and along, well, uh, he and two other students, they were arrested for the possession of marijuana and LSD in just like one of a neighbouring county. This time he couldn't post the bond though. He'd spent five days in jail and even though the charges were against him, um, the other students would end up being, they would end up being dropped um, due to a lack of evidence. So they would end up, that would end up not stuffing up his life quite the way it could have. So after being arrested and the animal torture incidences, he would actually withdraw from the Art Institute. Some articles say he's been asked to leave um, and some say um, that he withdrew and some say that he was asked to leave the university. So don't know yet. But he would remain in Kansas City and he would move to the Hyde Park District. He would move to 4315 Charlotte Street. And this house is going to be known as a real house of horrors, guys. But before he moved into that home, he would work as a short order cook in different restaurants around Kansas City. Um, this was to assist in paying his lawyer fees and fines from the drug arrests he had at the age of 19. And to get a little bit more money, he'd start to sell art and antiques that he received from his pen pals um, from Africa, from Asia, South America and other Pacific um, island countries. And this was the first sort of side business that he would operate outside of his home. Now, these have become really quite popular and he'd actually start earning some really good money from this. So by the mid-1970s, uh, he began working as a senior cook at some really well-renowned well restaurants around Kansas City. He would also join a local chef's association and helped establish like a training for any aspiring chefs and anyone in the, in the local community college. Um, but at the same time, so in parallel, his little art business is really starting continue, to continue to grow. So he begins devoting a little bit more attention to that and he decided to sort of start swaying away from that sort of chef business. But by 1981, uh, he'd established a few a couple of contracts uh, with some national and international contacts for his business. So he would end up seeing this as more of a full-time job and wanted to do this a little bit more, wanted to invest it more of his time sort of in, in the arts and all things related. So he would end up opening a store which he'd call Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, uh, where he would sell art, jewellery and antiques from all around the world. Now, this is where we're going to get to the grisly part of this podcast, guys. There are six known victims. The police have definitely suspected more, but I can't find their names. I certainly can't find out any further details. But before I do begin this, I want to let you all know it's going to get gruesome at times, okay, guys? It's going to get gruesome. And the content might be quite traumatic for some of my viewers, some of my listeners. So please be aware of this. Um, some of the videos, some of the montages that run in the background, they can be quite confronting as well. I know I've mentioned this at the start of the podcast, but guys, I want you to be really, really aware. It can be quite graphic. Now, it's believed that his first victim was in July 1984. His first victim was Jerry Howe. Uh, he was just 19 years old. His dad, Paul, had actually dealt with 
Robert uh, in some of the same circles as the art stuff. So I think that's why Jerry ended up trusting him and getting in the same car. Um, there's no need to fear anything, right, when you already know this person. Um, but he'd known Jerry for just over a year and he promised that he'd drive him to a dance class contest in a neighbouring county. Um, and this would end up being Jerry's worst decision of his life. Like it was just, it's just horrendous, guys. Now, I believe that the next part um, of this and the information that I'm going to share is actually from Robert's confession. So on the drive, he would pry uh, Jerry with some alcohol, Valium and a sedative. Now, he would wait until he was unconscious and then he would take him back to the house. Once Jerry was restrained at the house, he'd inject him with all sorts, all types of tranquilizers and end up tying him to the bed. Now, over the next 28 hours, he would be put through hell and back. He was drugged, he was raped, he was tortured, and he was violated with different types of foreign objects. The whole time this is being done to him, he's asking Robert, why are you doing this to me? And begging for his life and begging for him to let him go. I can't imagine the fear that that boy had to endure while he's held captive and in those last hours of his life. But during his confession, Robert didn't know what killed Jerry specifically. He wasn't sure whether it was because he choked on his own vomit. He wasn't sure whether it was like a combination of the drugs and the gag he had in his mouth. Whatever it was, it ended up finally causing his death. But apparently, now I use this word apparently or allegedly, he did attempt CPR. I'm not sure if I believe it was for the reasons that he said. I think it was to keep him alive so he could keep torturing. I don't think it was for any good reasons why he wanted to continue CPR. I will warn you once again, the method in which he disposes of the bodies, it's going to get a little bit grotesque. Okay, guys, it's just, it's just a little grotesque. Now, he would take Jerry's body to the basement <clears throat> where he'd suspend his body from a frame and hung him upside down. He'd cut the major arteries to drain the blood. Um, he would then use a chainsaw and boring knives, I think they're called, uh, to dismember the body. Uh, once he'd finished dismembering them, he'd wrap parts of it in plastic and then he'd place it in garbage bags. He would then leave it in his garbage bin to have their weekly, you know, garbage guys come and collect it. Um, there's a certain extent of this kind of stuff that I think this shows you uh, that he thinks of his victims as garbage, like just the way he throws them away and doesn't even, you know, sort of consider them human or anything like that. We've seen it a couple of times on a couple of different podcasts on how this can, you know, sort of be like that. But it's really showing you how much disdain um, and how little they think of their victims as being humans. He'd even be questioned in uh, Jerry's disappearance and he'd tell the police that he dropped Jerry off at the dance and just had never seen him again. Um, this is something that I read and it's part of the evidence that was found in his home. He would end up keeping a log in which he'd detail, detail out every torturous act that he had committed on his victims. Now, it would be noted specifically in these one of these law books that it would, he didn't do it for fun. Uh, rather, he said that it was um, called a physical and mental satisfaction. I, I, I don't really know what to say to that, guys, because it's just one of those things that I guess you just sort of sit there and you go, surely you're getting, like, surely there's some enjoyment out of it. Like you wouldn't just do this to have a mental satisfaction, surely. Like, the, And then because he's saying physical satisfaction, I'm also a little bit of me goes, oh, hang on, is there a sexual component to that as well? Because, you know, you get off on that, that torture and that, the fear and all that kind of stuff. So it's a power play. Um, I definitely think that is possible. Um, but it's just definitely one of those things that just always like sort of sits in my head. Um, Sorry, side note. Um, he would have a cooling off period of about nine months after the initial first murder, but in April 1985, he'd claim his second victim. Now, this victim would be 23-year-old 
and Robert Sheldon. Uh, he already had somewhat of a relationship with our Kansas City butcher, but I am going to refer to our second victim as Sheldon, given that his first name is Robert as well. So Sheldon would arrive on his doorstep. He was begging for a place to stay. And even though he was a really good tenant, he was nice, he was responsible, he paid his rent on time, Robert would find that he was a nuisance and disruptive to his life. And even though he wasn't physically attracted to him, he would end up uh, drugging him and holding him captive as well. Now, one night in April 1905, he came home to find that Sheldon was drunk and he decided to take his anger and his frustration out on him. He wasn't so much angry at his intended victim, but he was angry at the world and the people around him. So even though he was not an intended and he was not someone who we wanted to physically be intimate with, he still chose to take his anger out on this person. So Sheldon was drugged with sedatives. He was held captive for three days and he endured several forms of torture. This include, and I, again, guys, I want to warn you, it's, it's graphic. These included the swabbing of drain cleaner in his eye, the insertion, uh, inserting needles uh, under his fingertips. <laughs> uh, his wrists were bound with piano wire as the purpose of permanently damaging the nerves in his hands, as well as filling his ears with the sealant that you use on the, top, uh, on the side of the bathtubs and showers to impede his hearing. And three days after he was first held captive, a workman had actually come around to do some scheduled works on the roof of this house. So this would end up leading Robert to fatally suffocating his um, victim, Sheldon, and he placed a sack over his head and then tightened up with a piece of rope. And later he ended up dissecting his part, his body in the bathroom. Now, our third victim didn't have the same cooling off period as the first. His third victim was only like two or three months after Robert Sheldon. I can only assume that the reason for this was because the victim became convenient and easy. But let's be clear, it could also be because he just started to enjoy murdering people. Now, Mark Wallace was just trying to get out of a thunderstorm and go into a um, Robert's tool shed. Mark also knew of uh, Robert. He'd done some previous work around the house. He'd done some gardening. He'd done some odd jobs. So again, he knew his uh, victim. He would be invited to Robert's home so that he didn't have to actually be inside that tool shed. But once he was um, inside, rather than drugging him against his will, he would actually be offered claw promosis Claw promazine, I think that's the way you pronounce it. Uh, this is a antipsychotic drug that helps in the treatment of schizophrenia, but in high doses, it can have a really calming effect and it can make you sleepy. Apparently, Mark was quite anxious, so that's why he was offered the drug to just, you know, make him feel a little bit calmer and a little bit sleepy. Now, once he'd taken the drug, he was taken to a second story bedroom and he would endure different types of torture this time around. Uh, he would experience electric shocks until he became unconscious. He began, uh, Robert began experimenting on Mark with hypodermic needles and inserting them in various places um, along his back. Now he would die on June 28th at 7 p.m. Now the reason that this is so accurate is it was logged in one of his kill books. Let's call them kill books because realistically that's exactly what it is. But he would die of a combination of the drugs, the gag, and a lack of oxygen. He would also be dismembered and disposed of. I'm just starting to see a pattern that just, yeah, he just he loves the torture component. Now, one of his acquaintances, James Ferris, would be his next victim. I'm starting to see a pattern that he knew all of his victims, which to me, it's just purely terrifying, right? There's something remote about a serial killer who, you know, there's something about a serial killer who picks remote victims, right, or random victims, but it's when they pick people they know. It just seems so much more personal and so much more frightening to me. I'm not taking away from any of the victims, but I just feel like if you know the killer, it just feels like it's worse to me. I don't know why, for me specifically, that triggers me a lot more. 
I just feel like you knew this person. You know their their wants, their needs. Their I just yeah, it's just mm, just does not sit right with me, guys. Um, James was have, just having to be down on his luck. He needed a place to stay. Robert would actually say that he accepted this request because he was going to hold James captive. Now, he would drug James as soon as he got back to the house. Uh, it was just in the food uh, that he'd actually given to him. Now, after James had passed out, he would tie him to the bed and torture him for almost 27 hours straight. The torture seemed to really increase in this victim. He would be subjected to 7,700 volts to his shoulder and his balls. Now, in addition to, oh, sorry, when he was doing the vaults, it was up to five minutes at a time, I might have, guys. It was, mm, mm. but in addition to this, he would be injected with hypodermic needles as well in his shoulders and his genitals. He would be raped and tortured for almost two days before he would end up succumbing to his injuries. Todd Stoops, he was a male sex worker who Robert had used in the past and he really quite liked him. Um, he would be invited around for lunch at Robert's house and he would be propositioned at that time and he would accept because he actually needed the money for drugs. Now, this would be the only known victim in 1986. Given that he'd murdered three people in 1985 and his cooling off periods were getting shorter, it seems unlikely that there would only be one victim. Or perhaps, my thoughts, are there are some victims that lived through the experience or perhaps they're still considered missing and have never been found. I'm not sure how much you guys have watched on serial killers and stuff like that, but these cooling off periods, right, the cooling off periods at the start, they're quite long. You know, there's a little bit, a little bit more time in between each of the victims and then it seems to speed up a little bit. For it to speed up and then slow down, I just, I don't see that happening. I, I, I don't, I don't think that for me, I just, I, yeah, I don't see that happening. So Robert would say during his confession that he'd actually been extremely attracted to Todd. Uh, he held Todd captive for two weeks before he died and he would gradually increase the terror um, to make him cooperate more and he actually wanted to make him his sex slave. He used electric shocks again. Um, he would use them to his closed eyes to blind him and injected him with drain cleaner um, in his larynx to attempt to take away his voice and silence him. It was during his second week of his capture that Todd would request a soft drink and a sandwich. Um, when Robert refused, Todd ended up bursting into tears. It was probably just all of that compiled of that rape and that torture. But at some point during his captivity, he would have a ruptured um, anal wall. Uh, this caused some bleeding and some discharge. And Robert ended up feeling really bad to him towards the end of his captivity. So he's giving him ice cream and soup and he just wasn't able to hold anything down. Apparently the last day of his captivity, he was so weak uh, that Robert would Robert would state that he had to sit, have be in a sitting position in order to breathe. Um, it would be that rupture that would end up causing septic shock, and this in the, this would actually cause his death in the end. Um, I couldn't verbalise, and I certainly didn't feel comfortable putting all of the things that had been done to Todd. Um, but this was next level. His his injure what he endured was next level. Uh, the next victim is our last victim that he killed. And I will explain what I mean by that. However, this is by far the longest and possibly the worst. Robert had become friendly with a lovely 20-year-old by the name of Larry Wayne Pearson in 1987. This friendship would begin when Larry started coming into his shop and we explained to him that as a child, he had a real interest in witchcraft and wizardry. Um, not too long after, Larry would stay with Robert for short periods of time. He would perform odd jobs around the house to just pay the rent. Um, now, even though during his confession, he would originally say, Larry, he didn't really want him to be one of his victims. Um, it would be just something that would pop into his head. 
when he bar- when he bailed Larry out of jail, um, that's when he changed his mind and he decided he wanted to hold Larry captive. Now, that night after he'd bailed him out of jail, he made certain that Larry was really drunk. He would then inject him with a sedative and would move him to the basement. It's there that he would bind Larry's hands above his head and tie him rope um, that he would basically, so tie the rope that was binding his hands to a brick column. He would then inject drain cleaner into his larynx and he would then start the electric shock therapy treatment, we'll call it. Um, he was definitely, Robert said that Larry was definitely the most cooperative of his, all of his victims. He endured it so much that by the fifth day, he was starting to earn a lot of his trust. Now, this torture for the past five days included repeated electric shocks, breaking of multiple bones with an iron rod in his hand. Now, as a reward for his cooperation, he ended up being moved to the second floor. Now, he, he said, if you continue to cooperate, he's going to stop inflicting so much pain. Now, apparently, according to the logbooks and stuff like that, it looked like Larry had trained himself to sleep without moving. This was to not antagonise Robert in any way or form. So he really, he became the perfect victim because he knew he had to be cooperative and compliant in order for the torture to be less. But after being held captive for six weeks, he became desperate and he bit deeply into Robert's penis um, that he could no longer. He, and, and he said, and he yelled at him and said, I can't tolerate this anymore. His response naturally, and I, God, I, I say that really horribly, was to kill Larry. He bludgeoned him to death. Uh, with a tree limb, and then he would end up suffocating him with a bag and a rope. After um, after he had disposed of the body and all that kind of stuff, he would actually drive to the hospital and be treated for his wound. Um, he would store Larry's head in a plastic bag inside a freezer, and he would then later bury it in the backyard. That would be found, by the way, guys. Um, again, there was a lot done to Larry that I didn't put in there. Um, but the fact that he was brave enough and I, I just wish the hospital had done more, um, like, come on, who has an injury of a bitten penis, you know, without something going on. Anyway, uh, everything changed in 1988 though with his final victim. Now this would be Christopher Bryson and thankfully he would actually escape and survive. So I'm not sure how he really would initially feel about that, like once you've escaped. Um, Christopher had quite the story to tell the police, but we're gonna we're gonna start this like we always do at the beginning. So in March 1988, Mr. Bryson, he was lure, lured to Robert's house on the promise of payment of sex. Uh, he would be knocked out as soon as he arrived, and then he'd be bound to a bed. Um, Christopher, once again, was subjected to similar sorts of torture as the other victims but after several days of abuse and torture Robert would end up explaining to Christopher Christopher, that he'd actually begun to trust him. Um, He also told him though he was willing to talk about certain aspects of the abuse and torture that he was inflicting he would not negotiate on the raping. So he'll stop the electric shocks but he won't stop raping him. He'll stop the hypodermic needles but he won't stop that. Um, and he would end the conversation by telling him that if he didn't comply, then he would end up like the others or something like, he alluded to something like that. It was pretty like, it was pretty threatening, as you can imagine, like pretty threatening. So after some time in captivity, I, I, I think there was about up to five days he was in captivity, but at some point he'd earned enough trust from Robert to convince him to tie his hands in front of him daily after the um, abuse uh, rather than to the bedpost. So he would later tell investigators that his only thoughts or only thoughts during his captivity were escaping. So finally he was able to actually break free of his restraints. He burned through the rope with a 
book of matches that Robert had unknowingly left behind, which is fantastic because, uh, you know, as, as he's gone off to work, he was able to break free. Now, after breaking free, Christopher was able to escape from the house by jumping out a second story window. He was wearing nothing but a dog collar around his neck. So he would end up breaking um, his foot upon his escape. I don't think you would even care about your broken bones, to be perfectly honest, after what you just endured. Then he ran towards a, uh, a meter reader that happened to be walking across the street. He'd be shouting at them to call the police, call the police. Uh, the meter reader would lead Christopher to the house he'd actually been going to and the people living in that house would end up immediately calling the police and the police would arrive just, um, I, they say a mi- minutes later, I don't know how long it actually took. So the police would question Christopher at that house. Uh, they would at first, at first he would say that he'd been hitchhiking when he was abducted. Um, I can only imagine that the reasons that he said he was hitchhiking was because he didn't want to admit he was a sex worker. You're less likely to believe about what happened to you given the time and given the fact that you're gay. So he reported that Robert had raped and tortured him for four days before he was able to escape by jumping out a window on the second floor. He would then tell them of the abuse that he endured on in that second floor Um, and that's where he had been held captive for the majority of his time, um, that he had been repeatedly raped, drugged, injected in his throat with throat cleaner. Um, We've seen this in the previous victims. It was to take away their ability to speak or to speak loudly. Um, Now, as they talked with, as as Christopher talked with the police, they noted that along with like his dog collar and his broken foot that he had red swollen eyes as well as visible scars and welts across the entire parts of his body. Two officers officers were discreetly um, told go and watch that property so go and watch 4315 Charlotte Street and he was accompanied to an officer to a medical centre for some treatment it was upon this that the police would go back to the station and request a search warrant for Robert's house now, after being discharged from the centre, he was taken, Christopher was taken back to the police station to be asked more questions. Now, he had told detectives that he'd been held captive by the person living at 4315 Charlotte Street. He also stated um, what the man had subjected to him and he went into great detail about what he had endured for four days. He also stated to the police that his captor had shown him photos of the men um, of men who looked like they were deceased and telling him that these people had been previous individuals that had he'd attempted to make their sex he'd attempted to make them his sex slave and you'll end up like them if you don't become like me, if you don't become my sex slave um he was told, Christopher was told by Robert that he had no intention of letting him go, that he was going to kill him. And he told him of the men that he had previously kidnapped, abused and tortured. That is one way to make your victim very, very like compliant. You'll end up dead if you don't do this. Um, if he become, Robert also threatened him with if you become a nuisance or a threat to him, the torture would become worse than he'd already endured, or he would simply kill him. So there's one way to, like, make you really comply. Now, once Robert had returned from work, the police were waiting to arrest him. They would quickly ask him if they could search his house, and as you can imagine, he's going to flat out refuse that. He was soon arrested. The police would take him uh, to the station, and they'd wait for that pesky search warrant to come through. Um, they couldn't have imagined what it was like or what they were going to find in that home. Now, I read in a article that the police had initially thought that this was just a lover's quarrel gone wrong. We have seen, um, I, I don't know if we've seen it sort of in the, we've seen it with a John Wayne Gacy. I think we saw it on a previous podcast, but Jeffrey Dahmer, this is how Jeffrey Dahmer didn't get caught. 
he would say on the people that escaped or, you know, I think there were two that initially escaped with Jeffrey Dahmer and he said it was a lover's quarrel. So the police sort of already had this mindset that a gay lover's quarrel, it's a violent relationship. So I don't know where they get that from, but they, they certainly had it, that mentality. Um, and this is what happens is these victims escape and they, they think that it's just a lover's quarrel. Thankfully, thankfully, when they got the search warrant, they realised how very wrong they were. Now, they would really quickly confirm all of the claims um, that Christopher had been restrained and tortured in that second floor bedroom. They'd enter the bedroom, they'd find the burnt ropes that had been attached to the bedpost. They'd also find in the room an electrical transformer that was plugged into the wall, um, which led to the bed so they were able to confirm that yes he had actually been electrocuted he had been endured that um there was a metal tray of syringes on it uh small bottles that appeared to have prescription drugs swabs and eye drops that were found near the bed so they found like that torture device basically on a tray uh they would note that the bed posts were excessively worn <clears throat> where it did suggest that there had been many restraints and many times that things were tied to posts and that whoever had been restrained here did struggle to get free. So I wonder whether that was like the six victims, right? Once they'd searched more of the house, they'd uncover a human skull uh, inside the closet, a partially decomposed human head in the backyard. Um, the search would also uncover multiple uh, bones stored in the hallway. Um, they'd been scarred by like a hacksaw and a knife. Uh, there was human teeth in some envelopes. In the basement, they would find a hacksaw, another type of saw and a chainsaw that had bloodstains, flesh and pubic hair on it. Uh, they performed some luminal tests uh, and that revealed blood on the floor of the basement as well as two trash, trash barrels and everything it looks like everything it looked like was covered in bloodstains so imagine like you're watching csi and all that lunol all that blue lighting up that's exactly what was what was that basement was like uh they also found 334 polaroids uh 34 snapshot prints of different men's stored in multiple locations around the house uh, in these pictures, uh, there was Christopher Bryson, there was multiple other men who appeared to be alive or dead, they weren't sure. Uh, many of the pictures were taken while they're being tortured. Um, they would re recover at the time several restraints, uh, lots of sexual devices, a lot of porno, um, hypodermic noodles and a book on narcotics and like what drugs to use and all that kind of stuff. In one bedroom in particular, on top of the dresser, they'd find those detailed kill logs um, that he kept on each of our victims. In a closet on the set on the second floor, they found many, many, many news newspaper clippings uh, relating to a missing man by the name of Jerry Howell, as well as a wallet and a driver's license to belong to a missing person by the name of James Farris. So it turns out that Robert was in questioned extensively about Jerry and James's disappearance. In both cases, as you can imagine, he denied any involvement whatsoever. He was even considered a prime suspect in both of those cases. Now he was placed under surveillance. I didn't I I didn't initially read this in one of the articles. I read it in, in one of the new ones. And even though he was under surveillance, they were unable to find any solid evidence linking him to them at all. So in both cases Robert refused to speak to the police without his lawyer present after giving his initial statement. Now, later after this, the lawyer actually ended up threatening to file harassment accusations if the police didn't continue, if the police continued to question and surveil him. Um, it does boggle the mind that they knew something was wrong with him and they just couldn't get the evidence, right? Smart man. I mean, we did mention earlier that he's actually intelligent. So as part of the investigation, the photos um, that the police would find depicted a section of the body, a section of the body of the person that was actually taking the um, photo. So at some point he was actually ordered to pose nude for a series of photographs. 
this was to compare images of those original Polaroids to determine if these, if this was his own body, if this was, if he was the person in those photos. Now, apparently, according to one of the articles that I read, right, this humiliated him, humiliated him, and it would actually help the investigation because it would actually help lead to a confession. Basically, he didn't want to be tortured or endure that again. Isn't that ironic? So initially, he's been tra- so initially he was charged with one count of felonious restraint, one count of assault, and seven counts of forcible sodomy. Now, the police would compile more charges against him uh, as they continued discovering more and more things at his house. He was assigned a public public defender as his legal counsel, but they held him in protective custody um, with a $500,000 bail. Now, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, if you do watch a lot of crime documentaries, they are quite often, especially um, people who, same-sex offenders, they'll be definitely segregated and will not be in certain parts of jails. Now, police would identify the victims through dental records and photos that family members would have to endure and identify of their loved ones. It would be such a horrible experience to be looking at those Polaroids. The first of his charges after this would be the dismemberment of Larry Wayne Pearson in July. Now, prosecutors had actually gathered enough evidence to go, to go along with the physical evidence they had. So he was formally indicted first for the murder of Larry Wayne Pearson by a grand jury in July 1988. He was arraigned and he actually ended up pleading guilty to, guilty to the first degree murder of Larry. Um, once the judge had actually accepted his plea, he would have to describe and confess on how he killed them. Now, he's sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Now, after sentencing, Larry was transferred to the Missouri State Penitentiary. He was later placed in protective custody due to concerns for his safety. It's really not a big shock to me that they're placed in protective custody because this is just what happens every time with these type of killers. But a second uh, guilty plea was submitted before the Jackson County Court in August 1988, and that would earn him a further lifetime without parole for the charges of forcible sodomy against um, Christopher Bryson, um, and he would also receive a further seven years pertaining to the counts of the restraint um, against Christopher. So he was sentenced in Christopher's as well. Now, despite initially pleading not guilty to the five remaining murder charges, um, with the agreement of two defence attorneys, Robert ultimately would plead guilty, would get a plea bargain. Uh, Now, the plea bargain was to avoid the death penalty in those remaining murder charges. So in this plea bargain, he would agree to confess in graphic detail to whom he had killed what disgusting acts he had inflicted upon each of his victims, how he had killed each of his victims, and what he had done with their bodies. Now, these confessions were done over a period of two or three days in December 1988, but in return for his cooperation and doing that, uh, the death penalty was not, was not seen. They didn't, they agreed not to seek the death penalty. So on December 19th, 1988, uh, he would formally waive his rights to be tried um, for those outstanding murder charges upon the understanding that he was to be convicted of one um, one more first-degree murder, and that was Robert Sheldon, and the other four counts were considered second-degree uh, murder. So he formally pled guilty to each of these charges before a judge um, members of the public were actually prohibited from attending this hearing. So it was only the family members of the victims and news reporters permitted uh, during these particular proceedings. But in response to these guilty pleas, the judge imposed a further five concurrent life sentences with an additional condition 
condition barring any future prospect of parole in the sole case of first degree murder, which he pled guilty. So he, he could never, ever be paroled, which I think, to me, I think that that's important. I don't think he deserves any type of rights in my mind. I just don't think he deserves it. So on October 8th, 1992, he was sent to the prison infirmary because he was having uh, some chest pains. From there on, he actually went to a hospital in Columbia, Missouri, where at the age of 43, he was actually pronounced dead from a heart attack. So his dad died of a heart attack at 39 and he died of a heart attack at 43. So by the time he was arrested, right, he's He's abducted, tort- tortured, and murdered at least six men. The Kansas City Police, they do suspect him of being involved in, t- in murders of two other men. But in addition to that, they find they, even though more than 20 different men were in positions suggesting they were unconscious or dead amongst those over 300 Polaroid photos, he was adamant that he only killed six people and the ones that he, you know, had um, the ones he confessed to and killed. So the question that I probably have, to be honest, is whether he really only killed six six people. There is thoughts on the fact that um, someone poisoned him to um, get him to have that heart attack at the age of 43. I suspect, though, given his family history, that it was just a heart attack. Um, his father died at 39. He dies at 43. Um, a death too quick and too simple for me. Um, I just, yeah, I, once again, they seem to get a really, really easy way out. Um, it's very sad for the, um, six victims and especially their families. I really, truly hope that Christopher Bryson was able to get some real help for what he had to endure. Um, and I do truly hope, um, that there is some peace of mind for those families that, he is no longer alive. Now, thank you guys for all listening to episode 19. If you do like that, uh, love this podcast, please hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. If this is your first episode, go and watch my other 18 episodes and my bonus Halloween episode. I hope you all have a fabulous weekend peanuts. Um, And thank you all for listening to my podcast. Bye.